Well, hello, hello. I am Brandon Kirby, the Drunken Libertarian. Happy as all get out to be here for the Taxation is Theft Fest 2020. We're ready for round two. And uh, with me here today is Vicki Rose. Vicki, how are you doing today? Hey, good morning or good afternoon. I'm not sure what time zone you're in, but I'm doing pretty well this Sunday. I'm on the east coast of the Great White North. So well, good, afternoon, right in, good afternoon. There we go. Yeah. Uh, just by way of a uh, biographical uh, note, I wanted uh, to say that uh, Vicky has been politically active since 2007, since the 2007 Ron Paul for President campaign, and is currently the Libertarian Party of Mississippi's District 1 representative. She is a mother to eight children, motivational speaker, and ran for Mississippi State House of Representatives in 2009 as a Libertarian. And Vicky, you're talking to us today about uh, protecting uh, Kratom from prohibitionists, how Mississippi fought back against the establishment. That sounds like one of the more interesting talks that we'll hear of the day. Well, I appreciate that. It's been a very interesting journey. And the story that I'm going to share about how I got involved with it is a little interesting. I'm not a consumer of it myself. Um, but just a little correction, 2019, I ran for State House of Representatives in my district. So just, just this last year. Okay, well, sometimes I make some I make stuff up, so you'll just have to bear with me. Hey, I do the same thing. Sometimes you got to do that. There we go. So, uh, you know, for the next uh, 45 minutes, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm just going to give a little um, bit more of an introduction myself. He did do the, you know, introduction of the bio that I had submitted with to Taxation SFS, and I appreciate that. Um, so I ran in 2019 as a libertarian for State House of Representatives against a long-term uh, incumbent who had been there for now, he's what, 20 years now? And he hadn't been challenged in, I think it was six, uh, 12 years, 12 years he hadn't been challenged. And during that campaign is when the Kratom issue had come up. And I had contacted the local uh, Libertarian Party in my neighboring county when it came up for them. And I said, hey, you guys need to get on top of this. You need to fight this. And I, I don't know what happened. It was lack of communication or, or uh, it just things just didn't quite, you know, get going with the ball rolling there. But for those of you who are, are watching this and are not familiar with Kratom, some people call it Kratom. It's the name, the way it's spelled there is um, K-R-A-T-O-M. And I'm going to give a little bit of background on the issue for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So Kratom is a plant. It's for the coffee species, and it is found in southeastern Asia, and it grows on a tree. It's from the leaf of a tree. And they have been using it there for thousands of years for pain relief, anxiety. And a lot of the people who work out in the fields will use this uh, plant to help them get through their daily lives. And in fact, the uh, employers out there would say that they would much rather have a person be um, consuming Kratom for their pain relief and to help them get through their day in the hot sun and the hot work rather than somebody that's using, say, another like an actual opioid. And they're a more productive worker and they're showing up to the work and they don't have all the issues that somebody would that is consuming the opioids. So back in the 1940s, um, the government, um, I think it was in Taiwan, I, I been a while bear with me here it's been a few months I have a lot of things going on in my personal life but the government out there um, banned it because they weren't receiving taxes on the sale of this product so they were losing income people were using this instead of heroin but they were able to receive tax income on heroin therefore it became banned so it's been pushed right. around America that this is a dangerous product because it's been banned in the, own, in the country from where it came. So, oh my goodness, we can't have this, but let's not tell the real story behind the situation. Right. Let's make it look like it's a lot worse than it really is. So in, uh, it came to America early uh, 2000s and people, I can talk to them and find out information from them about when they started using it. I've had people contact me that have said they've been using it as early as around 2009, 2010 in America. And in 2016, the, uh, the USDEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, um, filed a notice of intent in August of 2016 uh, to say that they wanted to put Kratom on the list is a schedule one substance. And I would like to emphasize the word substance there 
because there's something else I'm going to be mentioning in a few minutes. But when they did that, it would take them two to three years to deem whether or not this product was actually harmful, like a public health crisis. So we're going to ask ourselves, what would have put it on their radar as to why they were choosing to put kratom as a dangerous substance right along with heroin and we've been battling marijuana saying this is a schedule one um, drug or substance and it doesn't cause the harm potential harms that some of these other items do so it has been used to self-treat issues like opioid withdrawal because it acts on the mu opioid receptors. It's, it is not an opioid, no matter what the uh, naysayers and the fear mongers might say, it is not an opioid. Um, it, people have been using it to self-treat symptoms related to chronic pain, chronic anxiety, PTSD. It comes in many different forms, such as dried and crushed leaves, uh, capsules, tablets, um, like a gum or a resin type thing. And it also, there is also a product for it, and I'll talk, get into that a little bit more later. It's, um, it's like an energy shot drink that can be found often at gas stations. So a number of states across America decided to start banning this product. Um, so I believe it started somewhere like Wisconsin and Florida and um, uh, Indiana. And if you look at those three states, they are the hotspots of where the opioid crisis actually took off from. It, and if this is something that's helping people overcome their opioid withdrawals. And this is something that's helping people to deal with chronic pain and anxiety without the side effects that opioids and prescription medications do. You can see where the pharmaceutical companies in those states would be pushing to have this banned. So the components of this product, the mitrogenine and the 7 um, are found to have show like anti-inflammatory um, uh, aspects to them and an analgesic activity can also um, work like I said on the mu opioid receptors and then neurotransmitters also like adrenaline and noradrenaline issues. I'm not a doctor so I'm just kind of regurgitating a little bit of information and then also you know parroting some of the stuff that I, I am uh, have become familiar with in the past with this. I am not a consumer of this product. I do have a friend um, well she was a ex business partner and she was actually a consumer of this product. And this why it kind of got on my radar in 2016 because she was consuming it. And we were really concerned for her when the DEA put the, was trying to put this on the schedule. So for about two weeks across America, it was actually illegal for anybody to have it or consume it. And they would be considered a felon and possibly be put in jail. They were talking about tracking people who would have this product in their hands, purchasing it online. And uh, consumers were blowing up the phone lines in Washington, D.C. And I believe uh, they even kind of melted the phone lines at one point because there's so many people who were calling thousands of thousands of um, United States veterans were calling in and saying, I use this for my PTSD. You won't let me use mar medical marijuana. This is what helps me, you know, get through my issues. And what do we have? We have veterans that are passing, that are committing suicide, 22 veterans a day, and you're going to take this away from them. And there are many different reasons why these veterans are committing suicide and a pain is one of them. Give them relief. So the DEA said, we can't do this. But the reason why they were choosing to do it in the first place there, that they were spouting was that they had an increased number of calls to the poison control centers. They were using this to justify this without having any government input um, from any government agencies or any public comment. And so what they said is, well, we've had 26 poison control center calls in 2010. And then in 2015, we have 263 poison control center calls. That's you know, and I'm, I'm not a medic and I'm not an expert. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not uh, someone who works in that field. But going from 26 calls across the entire country to 263 within five years does not seem like a public health crisis to me. And if you have thousands and thousands of people, actually millions of Americans who use this, consume this product, for their own benefit, for whatever relief that they are receiving in their body, I'm not saying that it that it's actually causing or changing the body in any way, but they are experiencing relief from this product. We should not be banning this. So I would like to also mention that the FDA in 2014 started cracking down on this product and they actually started seizing, banning imports of this product. They actually started seizing um, packages that, that were uh, packaged illegally. And I know that our next presenter, Dr. Mary Ruwert, 
Um, we'll be talking a little about about FDA, and one of the things is the, the packaging. You know, if you can't, if you have something uh, written on the package inappropriately, it's illegal. You can't you can't sell it in America. And one thing, so I said, I mentioned substance. This is a substance, right? They wanted to put it as a substance. If you look at the Schedule One classifications, they call it drugs or substances, things that people can use. And one thing that I find kind of funny in this fight against um, the people who would try to ban Kratom is that they use the word drug. They continually call it a drug. But I'm going to read to you from the Federal Drug Administration itself, what they define the word drug to be. And if you and keep in mind that if you call something a drug and they have not deemed it a drug, you could be fined. However, we have the Department of Health across America that are continuing to call it a drug. So I kind of laugh about this. So a drug as defined by the FDA is a substance that is recognized but in an official pharmacopoeia or formulary, a substance intended for use and diagnosis cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of a disease. Now, the product of Kratom has not fit into any of those categories. It has not been studied. In order for it to be studied, as Dr. Ruhr will even talk about, it has to go through a particular process that the government approves. It will never be considered a drug. However, we have departments of health across the state using the word drug to call this substance a drug that people are consuming for their own health. Now think about it. If you use a drug, uh, there is a certain stigma that is associated with that. I get testimonies from 60, 70, 80, and 90, literally 90 year old people who sent me testimonies as I worked on this product here, worked on protecting this product in Mississippi for the consumers to be able to purchase them, for those who are retail um, to be able to continue to sell the product they have purchased to be able to sell. 90 year olds talking about using this for their own pain mitigation. Right. They are, there are people who are sitting beside you in the church, who are sitting in the front row even next to you, who possibly could be consuming this for their own benefit and you not even know it. And so if you say the word drug, it's going to give the stigma. All of a sudden, drug is a sin, right? Uh, and we are largely still a Judeo-Christian society in America. And then we also have you know, the, the rising Muslim pop population. And they also have things attached to what is considered a sin, what is and what isn't a sin. And if you are breaking the law, if you're consuming a drug, then you are a sinner and you have a, a stigma attached to you. So if you start calling this a drug, the health departments, they just kind of know this psychologically. If you start calling this a drug, you're not going to be using this because more people will be will tend to not use it because they don't want to be put into that category and classification. And in fact, I had a number of people who were telling me that I can't testify because I'm afraid that I'll be put in jail. So, yes. Well, testify to what end? testify as to the benefits that I am using okay. that, really? that when I use this product, the benefits that I receive in my own body. And so in Mississippi, uh, in 2018, Senator Younger filed a bill, um, Senate Bill 2475. It did not make it out of committee to ban Kratom. Uh, 2019, uh, it was a House Bill number 1168 that Representative Jeff Smith out of Caledonia, Lowndes County, Younger is also out of Lowndes County, filed to ban Kratom. And uh, so then fast forward to 2020. We had, uh, so, I'm sorry, let me, in 2020, we, we did have a bill that we fought and we were able to significantly have some impact as a group of individuals, consumers and non-consumers alike, uh, mostly consumers, but there were non-consumers who were fighting for the right for people to uh, self-preservation, as you will. So the effort started in 2019 in Lowndes County. Prior to 2019, there were a couple of counties across Mississippi who had already banned the sale and the consumption and the, um, and the ability to have the product in their own localities, their own local governments. And I'm not going to complain about that because that is, you know, in the libertarian world, we're talking about localism. Adam Kokesh, one of our presidential candidates, will talk about how um, localism is where we need to be working at the most local level. And that's absolutely true. And I'm not going to complain that local governments are taking their, you know, their duly given authority to ban a product. However, let's take a look at this. Let's see if this is something that really needs to be taken care of. Um, so, we have in Mississippi right now over 30 cities and counties that have actually banned this and put it on a schedule one classification list in Mississippi. So they're saying this is just as bad as heroin or crack, cocaine, anything of that nature. And 
if you if you are in possession of the product or if you <clears throat> excuse me or if you sell it you stand to face a fine of a thousand dollars and up to six months in jail wow yes so uh in Lowndes county when in 2019 when it was quite evident that this bill was not going to make it out of committee jeff smith who lives in caledonia who is a representative from caledonia who had introduced the bill in 2019 went to um the board there along with another private group and said uh they call it the task force uh this task force who was met with the mississippi bureau of narcotic Narco narcotics i'm sorry the mbn and said this is deadly this is dangerous we've had uh what is it we've had about 18 i think people who no eight deaths last year okay and this is very deadly and it's being sold over at the gas stations over the counter and teenagers can get their hands on it and we have to ban the sale of this right now right away so they did um with very little public input and then it went from so Lawrence county is my neighboring county and it was actually part of the district that i was running for my district for state house of representatives covered a portion of octaba county um, clay county and a portion of Lowndes county also so these were my people and i am not a consumer but i saw that this was happening in caldonia and then it happened in the city of columbus which is the largest city in the city of Lowndes county in the county of Lowndes county and is county seat and then the county of columbus decided to ban it all because the this group this task force had come in and gone around along with the share um a sheriff's candidate um eddie hawkins who was a member of the mbn and he was heading this task force up and they came to my city I'm sitting in city council meeting and this gentleman, um, I, I can't remember his name, Glenn, Glenn Lautzenheiser shows up along with Dr. Rhea, who is, uh, he wasn't practicing at the time. He's an orthopedic doctor and they stood up and they spent 30 to 45 minutes talking to my board of selectmen about how my city needs to ban this product. They're not even from my city. That pissed me off. You're coming into my territory. These are my people in my town and my community who are consuming this product. And you're gonna tell my board of selectmen what we should be doing in our, in our city because you're afraid of it getting into your town and your community is ultimately what it boiled down to. Because if we didn't ban it in, the, in Clay County or the city of West Point, then people will be able to drive over here 15 or 20 minutes and purchase the product for themselves. And then their police officers are gonna be responsible for putting people in jail. Right. It's banned completely in the state of Alabama. And my city is about a 30 minute drive from the Alabama border. So okay. I, I noticed that they, the city um, selectmen at that moment in time, they said, we're not going to do this. We will have an opportunity for public comment. And, uh, then the group went to our my county board of selectmen. I was there at that meeting and I stood up and I gave a 12 minute speech, which was recorded and streamed online, talking about the fact that um, why, why should we be approaching this? Why should we be criminalizing something that you consider to be a moral issue? Because at the root of addiction, is it's a health crisis. This is a, and then you right. don't uh, you don't believe that somebody shouldn't be consuming a product. That is your belief. Well, leave that belief for yourself and for your household. But this so this is a moral issue. Why are we criminalizing something as moral? And I said you will be turning the citizens of Clay County and into criminals with the stroke right. of your pen. Yes. And the board of selectmen didn't even realize this because what this group was doing was they were taking the ban that other counties have put into place like Union County and up in New Albany. And they had said, this is what's working everywhere else. So here, take this, just put your county name in it and do it. They were, this is what, this is what other counties are doing. And I held up this piece of paper with this ordinance and I said, you are going to turn the citizens of Clay County and West Point into criminals overnight, you're gonna put them into jail because they are trying to preserve their own life. The Ninth Amendment guarantees all rights that are not to be, to be given to all individuals that are not exclusively mentioned in the Constitution. And our founding fathers had influence by Sir William Blackstone. And one of those rights that he recognizes is the right to property and self-preservation, to preserve one's own life. Right. Can, can you uh, just slow down for a little bit? I'm a, I'm a stupid, stupid dumb dumb when it comes to American law. When you say Ninth Amendment, 
what uh, what exactly is that? Okay, the Ninth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it talks about, uh, I, I don't know it verbatim, but the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America says that all of the rights that are um, guaranteed, the in natural rights to this, to all citizens, to all Americans are guaranteed, even those are not expressly mentioned here. So Sir William Blackstone was a prominent writer during the time of our country's founding. His writings were actually number two behind the Bible. Okay, oh, they were okay. second, second best-selling writings in America, and they highly influenced the thoughts and the beliefs of how this govern of how this new country should operate. And so there were three absolute rights to the individual that he identified over and over again. And the absolute rights are what guaranteed by the Ninth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And Article One, uh, I'm sorry, Article uh, Three, Section Thirty Two of the Mississippi State Constitution. F um, echoes that very amendment. So I told my board of supervisors, I told the city of, um, uh, board of selectmen also that if you decide to ban this product, you are violating your oath. And I said, there are U.S. soldiers who are in right. our city, in our community, who are consuming this product to help with their PTSD. We have individuals who cannot go to the doctor. They cannot afford to go to the doctor. They cannot afford to get a prescription for the diabetes medication, the pain that's associated with it. But they're able to consume Kratom and pay $25 to $50 a month for that and right. experience relief. They're not on the um, uh, medical system as far as drawing um disability any longer. So they're not a burden to society any longer. It's, it's a relief of the tax base when it comes to this issue. And they're a contributing member of society. They're happy, they're healthy, and their families are whole again. And you're going to take this from them with a stroke of your pen. Well, my board of selectmen said, no, we're not going to ban this. Next week, the board, uh, city board of supervisors, my, my mayor, when we were in the meeting, I brought um, Yatin Patel along with me. He is a um, a retailer of the product in my city, and he brought the product with them. The mayor of my city looks at Yatin and he says, are you collecting sales tax on it? Yatin says, yes, sir, I am. And he says, well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> so um, they realized that this wasn't as big of a threat though, as what this group is that's going around North Mississippi. So in 2020, we have another bill introduced by Senator uh, Chuck Younger into the into the state Senate to ban Kratom. It was double referred. It was referred to the Drug Policy Committee, and then it was also referred to Judiciary B. And then it was also, um, there were also two um, sister bills that were submitted to the House in 2020 by two different individuals to ban the substance. One was from a county who were, was already banned, and I don't recall where the other one was from. So they all had the same language and they all had the same intent behind them. So then it went to drug policy also in the House. And that committee is a lot larger than the drug policy committee and the Senate. The Senate has about 52 members in the state of Mississippi. And our drug policy committee had, I think, 11 or 12 members to it. So I'm looking down at the roster and I'm thinking, okay, we have some friends. I know we have some friends with this issue. We have some friends in the Senate who will say no to banning this. But this, the... Um, it's very, very strong. The desire to ban this is very strong. Mississippi is a prohibitionist state. We can't even uh, ha grow hemp here. We're one of the few states in the country where we cannot grow industrialized hemp. They are afraid of people that are going to uh, get high off of it. There's a lot of misinformation about it still. And we are a state where we had, what was it, um, in 2018, someone in, in the city of Columbus, again, Lowndes County, who was arrested for um, 1,200 gallons of, of having 1,200 gallons of moonshine, who was harmed by the person having 1,200 plus gallons of moonshine, right? And <laughs> well, you know, as a connoisseur of uh, scotch, I, I, there is a principle of harm. Moonshine is subquality uh, alcohol. We need to raise the quality levels. Oh, I think some people would um, would move to disagree with you there. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't use the state to impose that, but uh, I, I insist. Oh, that would be the free market would take care of it. Absolutely. It does, a great, there we go. it does a great job of that. 
So we're in a state where it we want to prohibit as much as we can. And I know that we were up against a big fight and the consumers who had found me because of the um, the Facebook live streams that I, that I had done, they connected with me, they pulled them into their group. Like, you don't even consume this and you're protecting me, you're protecting my life. But see, the right. thing is, is when I stood up to talk at my county board of supervisor meeting, I was the only one there. There were no wow. consumers present because they all had been messaging me, telling me, I cannot stand up and speak because if they see who I am and they see that I'm consuming this, then they're going to come after me if they make it illegal. And I have to take this product. I will find any way that I can to take this product so I can continue to live. This is my lifeline. Right. And in the city of the West Point, the same thing. So we go up to to Lee County and and um, where Tupelo, birthplace of Elvis Presley, by the way, um, where they were trying to ban it and they didn't ban it. The thing, this, what we find is that when we have individuals who are consumers and non-consumers that stand up against this task force that is going across the state, typically it is not banned. There has only been one county where it has been banned, where we've been able to go and and speak at. And that was um, um, not a county. There was a city. The city of Boonville decided to to ban it, and that was back in January. So, um, county after county, we see this ban coming across the state, and we have individuals who are scared, scared that this product is going to be taken away from them. Um, I don't know how much how long we've been going here. If you could let me know. I, well, I always keen to interrupt at any time, but uh, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left until formally we get to the Q and A. But uh, if, okay. if you want to go there early, I'm I'm happy to play ball. No, I'm just I just have a, a list here, and I like I said, I I can talk for a long time if I need to. Yeah, I don't think you've ever uh, encountered someone more passionate about uh, opposing prohibition than I am. So the more you want to talk, the happier I am to listen. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. So we we ended up um, getting we have the KCPA, which is the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, it has been going across various states. I believe Utah was the first one to pass it. Um, the state of Georgia also has one. It's being pushed by the American Kratom Association. So the Kratom, Kratom Consumer Protection Act actually protects consumers and the retailers to be able to sell this product without banning it. I personally don't like it. That's just my own personal feelings about it because I don't think that there should ever be regulations being put on a product. I don't right. think that we should have age limits being put on a product. Um, however, there is a reality. And as I talked to Dr. Mary Rort, who again is your um, next presenter here, I got on the phone with her. I was talking to her about the synthesization of this product. I was asking, picking her brain on what are some possible solutions? How can we approach this? Because the senator that I was working with, who is on our side in the state of Mississippi, um, he says, you know, give me some ideas, give me some solutions, maybe possibly that we can actually, you know, make this thing work, some op some other options, even other than possibly the KCPA. And so I was talking to Dr. Brewer, and we both came to the same conclusion that the end goal is for people to be able to protect themselves and to be able to um, preserve their own lives. And if that means that we have to give a little and that they're still able to consume this product and they're not being told no, right now, that is the end goal because people are hurting. And once we can have other legislation um, rolled back as far as, far as marijuana, ending the war on drugs, until that happens and there are other opportunities available for them, we need to protect this for the consumer as much as we can. So part of the Credit Consumer Protection Act was to ensure that the, the, the products were not adulterated um, there have been some products that right. uh, the FDA has pulled as it's come into the country because it had salmonella in it. The case, uh, the, the, um, the American Kratom Association, the AKA, has said that, well, we need this to ensure that it's not got salmonella. I'm, I'm not buying that because it's already protected that way. We've already seen evidence of that happening in the market. And uh, but they want to be able, again, to protect it in the end. So. The individuals who consume this were pushing KCPA, pushing it left, right, and center. And 
They're looking at the AKA and saying, where are you in Mississippi? We're dying here. We're dying on the vine. So I said, you know, we're going to go. We're going to go down. I have a group of people who I've been in communication with. They've never been to Jackson, Mississippi. They've never lobbied before. They don't know anything. So I said, you know, I'm going to take you guys under my wing. I'm going to show you how to do it. And that's why I wanted to do this presentation here with right. the taxation at CFS, because I want people to see that there is a process and this, there's a way that you can implement these steps for yourself. Yes. All you need is a group of people who are extremely passionate about a topic and there is there's a passion is what drives you yes there's going to be frustrations there's going to be row bumps along the way but you have to hold on to your passion so what we did was we walked right into the state capitol the bill we knew which committees it had been assigned to committees had not started meeting yet the um, legislator had just started the, the the lawmakers had just started coming to jackson they were communicating back and forth having little bitty meetings here and there getting a feel for what the bills were so nothing had been discussed yet and that's the bright time to really start getting in front of your face of your lawmakers so what we were doing was we were encouraging people I, I created a template for individuals I said okay I want you to send this message to your personal um, senator to your personal um, representative I sent them links how to find out what they were and then I said I also want need you well we need you to send the same thing along with your testimony about this product and how the consumption of it has helped you. I also need you to send this to all of the members of the um, Senate committees, the two committees it was sent to, and the House committee where it was sent to. And um, in that process, make sure you're doing it in a BCC, blind copied format, so that it's not being sent to everybody all at the same time. If you get a reply from one of the senators or representatives, it's not going out to an entire list again. It's just a conversation between you and the other Senate person who responded to it. So they did that. And in that process, during, while they were doing that, four of us went to the state capitol and we hunted down the chair of the Drug Policy Committee, who was diametrically opposed to allowing this product to remain on the shelves in the state. He has, um, Senator Jordan has been in um, Mississippi politics for almost all of his life. He's a retired chem um, chemistry teacher. He has children who are um, in the medical community. Uh, one is a pharmacist, I don't remember the other that are doctors, telling him that this is a very dangerous product. And so he's listening to all this information. Dr. Rhea comes in with the Lowndes County Task Force. Glenn Lautenheiser comes in. The Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics comes in. They have his ear before we get to him. And so we get to him and we're, he was very kind and very nice. He told us he would give us a platform at a public hearing. Didn't really believe it. And then um, we move on to a couple of other key members within the various committees. Walked downstairs the first floor. I don't know if you've heard of the name Chris McDaniel, but he ran for U.S. Senate two times in the state of Mississippi. Very contentious races, and so he he kind of you know he know he knows me. We've never officially had met before, but I said to the gals who were with me, I said, you know what, we're going to go to McDaniel's office because he's going to be a friend with us, and he's on drug policy and judiciary be in the Senate, and he's going to help us with it. So we walk in his door. He's getting ready to walk off to a meeting with the governor, and I said, no, we need you for ten minutes. And he said, well, explain to me what this is briefly. So we explained to him what it was. We talked to him about the product. And he said, you're right, this shouldn't be banned. And he said, I'm going to buy some of it myself and see what happens to me when I take it. And so we had a friend right there, along with Melanie Sojourner, who was a vice chair of the Drug Policy Committee. In the end, um, the Drug Policy Committee ended up adopting the KCPA instead of banning it, where they, they actually made a decision rather than just letting it die. Um, but we did have some other struggles. So the AKA was not, they had hired a lobbyist in the state of Mississippi and the lobbyist was only focusing on the house. And the consumers in Mississippi were saying, why aren't they helping us? Why aren't they helping us? Where is this lobbyist? We have had one conference call with the AKA. They say that they're helping us. We don't see anything. I give the AKA a call. And Mac Haddle calls me back and he, he has an understanding that I have been opposed to the KCPA publicly, but I am not pushing anybody to not pass the KCPA. Personally, I'm opposed to it, but I'm not pushing anybody to not pass the KCPA. And so I said, you're, you're lobbyist. I don't know what he's doing. Nobody has seen from him. We've been down at the Capitol. We've been talking to people. We can't find your lobbyist. The people that we've been talking to in the Senate haven't heard from him. And it's going to come out of the Senate before it goes to the House. 
And I said, your lobbyist is not working the Senate. And so he hem and hawed about it and said, well, we'll connect you with them. And the lobbyist never contacted me. Two weeks later, I, we get information that the AK is coming to Mississippi. I was sick. I think I had the coronavirus. I don't know what it was, but I was sick. I wasn't going anywhere. But the other ladies showed up there. They're, they're getting the ropes. They're having fun. They're learning how to pull people from off the floor, sending messages to them, talking to them face to face, shaking their hands, handing them packets of information, getting in front of the people, being very aggressive with this, building a little army of Kratom anti-prohibitionists -prohibi for Mississippi. And we were leaving an impression. And this is what everybody can do with every topic that they're passionate about. It just takes a matter of people. And I have eight children and I'm doing this, y'all. Okay. <laughs> I have a very busy life. I, I am a business owner. Heal myself. I, 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 I work with clients one-on-one -on -one online, day in and day out. And if I can do this, you can. You can find time to take off work or however it is that you're going to, to meet in front of your lawmakers and, and talk to them about this issue. So the AKA actually came down. I, I, I told Leslie, I said, you know, Leslie, tell them that they have to meet with Chris McDaniel because they hadn't met with him yet. I called Chris McDaniel as soon as I found that they were there that day. I said, have you talked to them? They no, I haven't talked to them. I don't even know who they are. Okay, that tells you what the AKA is or isn't doing. So they go and they meet with McDaniel. We had a public policy. We had a public hearing set up within 24 hours. So as, a, as an individual activist, working as a libertarian, I am seeing the value and I have seen the value and being pragmatic about something. Yes, we can be staunch and we have to stand our ground about certain issues, but we have to be able to work with both sides of the aisle work with groups that we might not necessarily totally agree right. with to get to the end goal <clears throat> and Definitely. what people are understanding about the libertarian candidate for president that is well they might be sound a little out there with with some of their ideas what people have to understand is that they have to work with congress but their ideas can influence some of the things that Congress is doing and turn the ship and steer it in the right direction. Definitely. That's why we don't need to be afraid of even some of the more robust candidates who are, who are being maybe a little on the radical side with some of their stances and what they want to do. So we ended up in the end result of all of our activism. I had sent out emails. I had sent instructions. I sent out pictures even. I created a document that had the pictures of every single senator the on the drug policy committee so people could carry it with them and identify them in the rotunda and pull them aside and talk to them. I, I worked on sending out emails. Okay, this is what happened. Now we had these meetings. Now these are the emails that have to be sent out. Here is a custom email for you to send to your friends and families who are not consumers, who support you in this. This is a custom email. Have them edit it to their liking, but also ask them to send it. Here is a list of people. Here's their Twitter accounts. Here is their Facebook pages. Here is their Insta messenger. Please be kind. Do not... Right. Um, talk to them in a hard way. Kindness will get you so much farther than people who are talking and calling names and trying to divide. But be passionate. Steer your passion in a healthy direction is, is, is one of the most important things that we can do. So uh, it, it was what was interesting, though, was the emails that I personally was asking people to create somehow was I think was getting to the American Kratom Association because I was seeing them send out almost the same exact thing to their email list of thousands of people across Mississippi after I was sending it out. So we can be innovators. What we need in this country are solutionaries, people who are willing to bring solutions to the table. And in fact, one of the solutions that we need, uh, I'll talk about in just a second, I wanna tell, tell the story of what exactly happened in Mississippi. So what exactly happened was a pass out of the Senate, um, the KCPA did, it got to Judiciary B, Judiciary B killed it. They decided not to bring it to the floor, not to send it to the floor because the Mississippi Department of Health was in their ear telling them that this is bad, 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 bad. The Drug Policy Committee state met the same day as Judd B in the Senate. Um, the Drug Policy in the House met the same day, same time. So while um, the AKA was upstairs with the Senate Judd B, we were downstairs in the House Committee listening 
trying to talk to them and and hear what they might be saying about they decided to not even take up the issue they decided to just table it and then it gets out of Judd B and they said we're not going to do anything with it so that means there's no crowd of consumer protection act i find dana criswell on the in the uh, rotunda and i said because he was on house um, drug policy committee i found him at about 11 o'clock in the morning and i said they decided to kill it there's no protection for Cadam in mississippi and he was just like and he said, well, the problem in the House, Judd B, is that we've got um, counties that are talking to us and they, they want something different than just the case. They have concerns of the Crowd and Consumer Protection Act, that it doesn't do enough for restrictions. Um, mm. So we still, we're still fighting prohibitionists in Mississippi. We get out of this, it, we get out of all of uh, the goings on, I guess you could say, of this, and we find that Boonville decides to ban it after we had spoken with them and there are other the the task force i think is you know we're we're still inundated right now with the coronavirus we're trying to keep on top of it see what people might be trying to do under closed doors and there's something really interesting when you bring up coronavirus there's something really interesting about um some of the aspect of the product of kratom the mitragynine it does have a um it actually does have a um component to it called Quinolizing. Does that sound a little bit familiar to you? Quinolizing. 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 No. So you've got the the HCR, the chloroquinin, the hydrochloroquinin that pre the HCR that President Trump was talking about. Okay. The dichloroquinoline, which is a product of the HCR, which is a component of the HCR, is in the same family as quinolizine which is makes up part of the components of mitragyny. Now, I don't know if they are in the same family, if they have the same effects, but there have been some people who have talked about the possibility that this product itself could have a little bit of benefit for the immune system for individuals with this virus. There is no evidence for it. Some people have questioned that. I just kind of bring that up as a little you know, interesting um, fact there. One of the concerns that we have in Mississippi when it comes to Kratom, other than it being um, uh, trying to prohibit it, the, the attitude toward it, calling it a drug. If you're on parole and you're found with Kratom in your body, even though it's not on the schedule as a schedule one substance, you're thrown in jail. You come out of prison, possibly having used other types of harsher drugs, harder drugs, and you need relief or you need anxiety relief. We know that prison life isn't exactly easy for somebody. It can bring a lot of post-traumatic stress to an individual, anxiety and grief and other chronic pain that people might have been dealing with. They get out of jail, they're on parole, they're going through their drug testing. If they are found with Kratom in their system, they are thrown back into prison. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with the issues that we've been having in Mississippi with the prison deaths. Back in January, we had um, riots, we had prisoners dying left, center, and right because of the conditions in Parchment, one of the oldest prisons in the state. One of those prisoners who was killed was put back into jail because he had Kratom in his system. Really? Wow. He was in his mid-20s. We are killing people with our policies. By sending this to the black market, it's, it's deadly. And if we send it to the black market, it risks, it risks being adulterated, right? Right. as with yeah. anything. And that's one of the things that the Kratom Task Force is going, the, the Lowndes County Task Force is going around the state saying, so we have energy drinks and there's, you can pull out, uh, there's two two main components that help with the uh, the benefits that people are you know why they're consuming it the mitragynine and the 7-hydroxy mitragynine. The 7-hydroxy mitragynine is a product that is being pulled out from the plant and isolated and being put into these energy drinks. Sometimes it's combined with some other herbs and it's being sold over the counter as uh, like an energy shot and an energy drink. So the Lawrence County Task Force when they started going across. Um, the Golden Triangle, which is the area where I live, and talking about this product, they said, one woman said, my husband was consuming, was um, spending $600 a week on this product. Well, our little group of, 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 of activists or anti-prohibitionists um, 
army contacted this ex-husband. He actually was consuming other products. He told her he was consuming Kratom because he didn't want to go to jail because he was addicted to other substances. Oh, I see. I see. And so the C so the FDA, the CDC are coming out. They're saying we have 100 deaths to Kratom related deaths. I stood in front of the public um, hearing at the state Capitol when they had it. We had people on both sides of the aisle. We had people testifying, saying that it's hurt them or it's harming the state. We had doctors testifying, drug agents testifying how bad it is. And then we have people test with their testimony of how it's helped them get their life back time after time after time after time. Wow. And the... Um, this gentleman who had the other substances that he was using that's his choice right but other than For that sure. he was lying right so it's all based on a lie the story i didn't tend to do that yeah well, I, well I, no i'm saying i'm saying the story the, to, to sell the idea that we need to ban this is based on lies that people are spending six seven eight hundred dollars a month so right. that what the, one of the things you're saying is that it's like morphine if you look at the studies, it takes 250 of those little shot bottles for it to be like morphine. One bottle is like 15 or $20. No one's going to consume 250 bottles in one sitting so right. they can have the effects of morphine. Um, but one of the things that they're also saying is that it's, you know, Kratom deaths. These are Kratom related deaths. And 60% of the cases of these deaths they're actually found to have been died by a um, heroin overdose. Yeah, something in addition. Do yeah. you mind if I uh, pick your brain for a couple of minutes here? You've Would thought about it. this a lot more than uh, I have. Um, can I just uh, ever so briefly get you to uh, take the side of the devil on the argument on this one? Uh, are, are What are the harmful, uh, the, the deleterious impacts of this drug? I love the question. It's a it's a really it's a really good question to ask because nothing is perfect, yeah. and every everybody's body chemistry system is different. Everybody's right. gut microbe system is different. Everybody's going to respond differently to a product from one to another. The woman who was our business partner who was using this product, she was consuming over three tablespoons a sitting. That is an exorbitant amount. The people that I'm traveling with are consuming two teaspoons at a sitting. And she was having a lot. She actually ended up with seizures because she okay. was over. She was taking way too too much of this product. Um, she ended up with, um, I think, some heart issues too. And she was very aggressive due to the overconsumption of this product. But there have been people who have gotten off of um, alcohol addiction. Um, like I said, the the opioids, prescription medicines, and whatnot. And um, she actually started consuming the Kratom because she was coming off an addiction to alcohol. Uh, there are other people who will talk about the impacts of the heart, that right. it, it can, because it is like a adrenaline or noradrenaline properties to it. Again, all body systems are different. And so the impact to the heart is nothing, it, it is of the coffee family. So it's like the caffeine impact. Right. It's like somebody drinking a lot of energy drinks. It's bad for the heart. It is. So you're going to tell me that. So this is one of the things that Senator Jordan was saying. It's bad for your heart. We can't have it on the on the shelves. Or are you going to take off all of all of the energy drinks and the monster drinks? Yeah, they'll have to be inconsistent. The coffee drinkers will revolt. Exactly. Um, and, then, and then it also causes some stomach upset. So if you take a little bit too much, you might get some stomach upset. Some people talk about it maybe possibly causing some constipation if you take too much. It's kind of like dosing yourself for trying to figure out. There are, because it is not regulated by the FDA, there are no dosing requirements um, that we can put on labels. They can they can suggest things, I guess. I, I, and right. Dr. will you know, talk about that. Prof, I don't know if she will or not, but... Um, I know she talks about how FDA harms, and this is one of the harms. When we can't put something on a label so we can have a, 
an accurate way because they deem that we can't because there haven't been studies done to it that fit their narrative. There haven't been all of the um, rigorous trials that they require and the billions of dollars is going to be required to spend on research in order for this to be able to be put on the market in a way they want. This is nothing more than myself going to my backyard, pulling off some pine needles off the pine tree, putting them in a cup of tea and choosing to drink them for the, drink the tea for the benefit of the vitamin C. It's, you know, it's something that I can choose to do for myself. Can I overdose on vitamin C? Absolutely. Right. Right. And it's up to me to, to be self-aware with that. Okay. In terms of a, a libertarian framework, and we can omit any sort of uh, government overreach for all the uh, anarcho-capitalists out there, the voluntarists. I, you know, I, I think I'm one of them. But uh, omit the government overreach. Uh, assuming it's just your private property, where is it that you draw the line? Uh, I wouldn't be comfortable with somebody doing meth on my private property. I, I don't think I'd be comfortable with that. Uh, but I certainly don't have any sort of a problem with uh, with uh, somebody smoking weed. And from what you're descri describing here, it sounds like the cost-benefit analysis is definitely worth it uh, for this product. Uh, it, it, where would you draw the line as a, a private property owner where you'd say, you know what, I don't know that this is, a, this is couth? It, it's up to the individual. I mean... A business owner can decide to sell it or not sell it. A, right. an individual. But you're an individual, so and you're smarter on this than I am. So, I, where where would you draw the line? For me, for allowing it in my home. Yes. I guess if if it was if there was somebody in my home that was within my family unit who was consuming the product and it they had the experience that it seemed like they were unhealthy with it that's where I would draw the line. I, I would be, you know, hey, I care about you. I love you. And I want to make sure that you're not going to harm your body so that you can live the best life that you can. Let's let's find out ways that we can maybe, if you still want to consume the product, you know, that's great. But let's find out ways that we can maybe ramp this back. Um, as far as, so are you asking about any substance or are you talking about this substance in particular, I guess? Yeah, well, I'm just thinking of how lethal fentanyl can be. Uh, compared to marijuana, like clearly there's a gradation of harm. Um, but like if if I had a tenant, for example, that just loved to smoke meth, uh, and we saw all of the negative impacts that are uh, normally associated with meth, not somebody who's uh, perhaps doing it uh, reasonably, but uh, you know all the harmful uh, impacts, I'd say, well, hold on. But I don't have, as a libertarian, as a voluntarist, I don't have a rubric in my mind where I draw the line ever so neatly. I, like I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, really quite honestly. Yeah. And when we're self-governing, that's what, that's what self-governance is, taking every situation in life and every circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis. Because no two families are alike, for example. Right. My relationship with, with my 19-year-old daughter is not the same as my husband's relationship with my 19-year-old daughter. He right. has to approach her in a different way than I would, right? So... We, we have to be true and reasonable. You know, as as I'm going to throw out another presidential candidate in the LP, as, as Serene Ardolano would talk about, being reasonable, not reacting based off of emotions, but pausing for a moment and looking at the situation with reason and saying, okay, yeah, yeah you know, this is my house or this is my property. You might want to do that, but I own this property. And I'm not going to accept this on my property. If you want to do that, go ahead and go over there and someplace else where that's fine. But this is my property and I just don't want this here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one last question and then we'll, uh, we'll have to uh, call it a wraps. Uh, you're talking about age limits. Are there any sort of age limits that you would uh, impose uh, yourself within your own uh, private property uh, jurisdiction? Uh, you're talking about, again, the, the topic is Kratom here. Are you talking about any particular product? With Kratom. With Kratom, no. Oh. Um, the, my children, I'm responsible for them. And if they um, need anything for their personal health and well-being, I'm going to give that to them as far as 
dosages and recommendations. I'm not going to hold that from them if I feel like it could benefit their body in any way. Like if they're um, having seizures. Correct. Um, so the age limits that they were trying to put with this bill was for the purchase, not the consumption of. The age limits was for purchase, purchase not, um, for no one under the age of 18. I guess I can understand that. And then um, the one of the um, places that sells like the powders here in my, in my community, it's a smoke shop. You're not going to get in there unless you're 21 anyway. Right. You, but if you had your own business, would you, would you sell it to somebody who's, uh, let's say, 12? I probably, I probably personally, I probably wouldn't. Um, okay. I, 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 my own personal um, views is that something that that should be um, a parental thing right. for them. Now, say they're like 16, 17, 18, maybe I might put them through a rigorous like um, a question yeah. thing to see if you if you're aware of you know um, the impacts of this, and then you know, yeah, you, yeah, okay, you've got this. That's how I view it. Again, right. personal responsibility, self governing, right. and. Um, if I believe that everybody should be um, make educated decisions before they make a purchase or allow something to be put into their body, I'm going to act that way toward other people. You know, um, if I believe that you're 16 or 17 and yeah, you're probably old enough to make some decisions for yourself, but I want to know that you're making an educated decision about this. I don't know. It's but then I have other thoughts going through my head and they're well, why not? Why would I do that? So I, I guess, I don't know. I'm not in that situation. Right, right. But yeah, no, I see what you're saying. There, be, there very quickly becomes a gray area. Mm -hmm. Are there any sort of uh, concluding thoughts, anything that uh, we've omitted that you were uh, hoping to add? I would just like to ask that everybody um, be diligent with what it is that you're passionate about. We yes. don't have to sit on our hands and or at our keyboard doing things. We have to be physically present physically yes. in front of our lawmakers if we're sending them emails and making phone calls that's one thing but when you physically show up you take the time not just where they are in their town because that's easy when you physically go to the place that they have to go to to do the work of the people it shows them that you're passionate about this and that you care. Right. You need to find a way to make it work, to do the footwork. If we are going to keep this republic, we have to work for it. Or the Confederation, in my case. That's right. It's all good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Vicky. It's a, it's a really important topic, uh, prohibition and uh, overreaching uh, tyranny on uh, issues that some people haven't really bothered to understand and they still want to make laws on it. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your passion on this. It's uh, been a really informative talk and uh, certainly uh, lighting a fire to get in front of some of the lawmakers for uh, those of us. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, Vicky, and uh, have yourself a great day. Have a great Sunday. Thank you.